Hey, and it's right at 9 o'clock. Glad you guys could come. Can everyone hear me? Let's get into your chat there. Gomez had a positive. How about you, Lore, Robinson, Jackson, Rush, Van? Yes, sir. It's Robinson. I can hear you. Okay. And how do you pronounce that? Biscoco? I don't know. Uh, Biscocho, sir. Biscocho. You know, it's just a long weekend. I think I forgot everything. <laughs> no worries, sir. Holy cow. Now they show up. No, what's going on? Hey, at 9 o'clock, everybody shows up on the right side and the left side. Got to love it, right? Uh, yeah. Sir, I believe it's uh, based on what chat you choose. So if you like choose general, I believe, it will show different names. Maybe that's the reason why when I hit the chat, everything showed up. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Hope you guys had a wonderful weekend. I know everybody's like, yeah, right. I didn't get to go out and party. I didn't get to go to the beach and all that kind of stuff, right? Wow, the enthusiasm is just awesome. No, maybe, could be. Any feedback? It's a lovely red color shirt you're wearing today, sir. Why, thank you very much. I'm doing my best to be colorful. I just every now and then get the uh, issue with having to resize that photo. Uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, one time the light does this to it, and the next time the light does another thing to it. Got to love these green screens in the time of day. All right, gentlemen, you guys ready for this? Yes, sir. Who was it that was asking me about link aggregation last week? It was me, sir. Did you do any research on it? No, sir. <laughs> I did. If you're a gamer, you don't have to worry about it. If you transfers a lot of files, then you might want to look at that. And it has everything to do as if you got a large switch to be put in. Like I got one upstairs. Uh, and I would probably try to do that since there are some files that get transferred back and forth. But not to the point where it's going to tax my internet service. Oh well. But it does have some benefits but not for gaming. So if you were thinking about doing it for gaming, you can, but it's really not going to be helpful in its overall. But if you have a few computers in your household that need to download and upload files on a consistent basis, then it would be because it's going to increase your throughput, but, uh, you know, what are you doing? Are, are you uploading and downloading a lot of YouTube files from several different computers? That might help. Look it up. It's a little bit more convoluted as far as trying to assign uh, addresses, IP addresses to each one of those individual switch inputs and outputs. Just thought I'd let you know on that, Aaron Robinson. All right, let's take a look at Objective 3 Alpha, identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, limitations of satellite transmit and receive systems. As you well know, we always come up with a AFSC application. You're going to touch these in some way, form, or another, uh, depending if you have a four-year career, six-year career, or throughout <laughs> the Air Force 20 or 30 years that you come into play. So we're going to look at the basic radio picture, fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessment, and ancillary functions. So we always go back and try to review the NSM and as you can see on the back of the case 
you guys are working with case A. There's also a case D out there. You'll get to see that in room 118 and 120, if I'm not mistaken. But on the rear, you'll notice that we have the 12 NRZ that you guys were playing with, depending on what port that you needed to put the, oh, look at here it comes, the D connector as well as you can see the six CDI, the six T1E1s, and the two hissy ports. So it's just identifying what's on the back of the case. Quite honestly, this should have been back in three, excuse me, two alpha, just to give you an idea. Not two alpha. Help me out there, Sergeant McCormick, is it uh, one delta for objective that the NSM is introduced, or is it one Charlie? Can you remember? Nope. Okay. We'll go on. Anyway, a uh, question. Oh, sorry, my mic was muted. Oh, okay. Uh, it's one delta. delta. It's one delta? Okay, good. This should be in one delta. I'm going to see about putting it in one delta. This is an awesome picture here. It is. Did I go through the NSM tech manual with you guys? No, I don't believe so, sir. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to change the course here. And we are going to take a look at the NSM extract. So pull up your extracts and follow along. This should be in your uh, file folder that you got from uh, the CTS. Does everybody have it? You should. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me readjust my screen here so you guys can see this. Well, whenever I get to the correct one, that helps. I was selecting on the wrong one. Okay, can everybody see the full tech manual in their display there? Yes, sir. All right, so here we go. Hopefully this saved everything. You guys know about warnings, correct? You guys should have been briefed that in block two about warnings, cautions, and notes. Yes, sir. All right. So let's see if this saved it for me where I don't have to go hunting for it. Well, I'll be darned. It didn't do that for me. All right, so first things first, we'll look at 1.3, which is the general function description. What I wanted to point out here is this section right here. Right, yeah, there we go. With this section that I just highlighted, what this is telling you is anything that you can do in multiplexing, it'll do in demultiplexing. This next sentence right down here, come on, let me have at it. Boy, it just doesn't want to do me any good today. All right, so this part right here, they talk about the GUI software. That's what you guys were playing with. Next up, we have our 1.3.1.5 external signal interface descriptions you'll see that Bravo is our NRZ you will see the max data rate at 1152 that's in legacy legacy meaning old farts like me 
enhance being new farts like you. So when you come right down to it, you guys are at a faster speed than I would be. So that's 8.448 megabits per second. In this case, it's kilobits per second, which is 8,444. You have the T1 E1 ports. Oh, look at this. Look at this. We went through signaling formats. Here's your alternate mark inversion. Now, I did some more research. Where is it? Where is it? Ah, here we go. I do crazy stuff on it. So, hey, the note. <laughs> uh, your first one, which is B8ZS, that is North American, and it throws the bit violation after the eighth zero. That's the T1. The E1, which is at Hotel Delta Bravo 3 alternate mark inversion, that's European or Japan. That one throws it on the third uh, bit if you're looking at zeros in a row. So if you get three zeros in a row, it's going to throw that bit violation at the third one. This is the way they do it. Don't ask me why or how. The engineering's figure this out. So we just have to follow it. CDI. You can see that we got legacy and enhance. Looking down at the youngsters version, it's a 4608 kbps. We also have the EIA 530 and if you guys hadn't noticed when you were putting the D connectors on the NRZ it should have had EIA 530 on them. Let me highlight that. You have legacy and enhanced. Enhanced this is where you get your maximum uh, data rate for it, which is 52 meg. Ah, yes, here's where the GUI is. The uh, peripheral equipment is what they classify it. Theory of operation. Uh, purpose of the equipment. Bottom line is it's multiplexing. Anything you're multiplexing will be BD multiplex on the distant end and vice versa if you can do it multiplexed or modulated or whatever you want to call it, then you should be able to demultiplex it on the opposite end, whether it's got encryption or not. You can see this is probably the best picture out there where it talks about your input to your NSN. NSM is going to go to your TSC 179 in block 9 up to a SAT stem, back down to another uh, set of cases on the TSC 179 into the NSM and so forth and so on. You guys are getting the precursor to everything. They talk about functional diagrams but this picture here where it shows you the ports you've always heard of a picture is worth a thousand words there you go. Tells you all the ports you need to know about and what more can you ask for? The only problem is you're going to have to figure out what the data rates are, which, again, go up to, what was it, 1.3? Yeah, 1.3.1.5. There's your information. This page right here, I just like to mention it, it is probably one of the best pages I have seen that explains our uh, non-nodal which is your, you know, your hub spoke, your mesh, your hybrid, and so forth and so on. It's just a clear picture of it. It's so much easier to follow. Uh, again, this tells you your port user interfaces. Tells you what they are and how to do it. Now this part right here says that any 12 of these ports can be active in a MUX or DMUX configuration at one time. In other words, you can have up to 12. 
if you have 12 T1E1s and so forth and so on. At least that's the way I understood it from the manufacturer when they say that. This part right here is a little confusing. It means that you can have 12 NRZ, but you can't mix and match 6 NRZ and 6 T1E1s and so forth and so on. And when we get to connecting, I just wanted to point out this part right here this is the back part of your NSM you'll notice that there are no lights all the lights are where on the front part the front. <laughs> I don't know where people say that oh there's a light on the back well that light might be down below and it's not part of the NSM there, here's all your lights just to make sure that you guys are aware so no lights that's where all the connectors are and then you have lights and of course each one of them are giving you an idea of what it should be in the operational and non-operational and you guys when you were doing your uh, checks with the NSM you should have had number five which is your air light if everything matched up should have been in the off mode and where have you seen this picture before oh gee it's on the GUI yeah the GUI once you enter everything in program it do what you need to do then you check it with your BERTs <clears throat> and that's about it for um, operational description I just wanted to point out your operation uh, portion and that's in uh, chapter 4 or text 4 so there you have it, gentlemen. You've gone through the NSMTO. You know where everything is at. Excuse me, tech manual. So anytime I make a save to that, I always, I don't know, for some reason, cancel this. Just exit out. No, I don't want to do that. So let's go back to our PowerPoint slide and adjust that accordingly. All right, so NSM, this is your basic radio picture. I'm not sure if you guys were giving, were given this basic radio picture as a handout. I don't go through it very much except for the slides. So if you want the handout, it is in the Tisser lab. So ask for it if you want it. Or if you really feel the need, I can go ahead and put it up into the resources as a handout. I think I have a bunch of handout sheets if you want to utilize them. Why is um, this? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think you cut out for the past like 45 seconds to a minute. Oh, so. no. Okay. Yeah. Where did I leave off? My is frozen. I think you were just changing over off the TO. Okay. So, did everybody see it now? Yes, sir. All right. So, everybody's back. You can hear me. Not glitching. Discord does that when we have a lot of bandwidth issues. Anybody else having difficulties? All right. So, this is where I was beginning here. So, we all caught up now? Yes, sir. All right. So this is the basic radio picture. If you want the handout, you know, to practice or whatever, I could give you a handout. If you want to get it sooner than later, that's where you're going to talk to me about. If not, you can wait until you get to the Tisser uh, lab, and you can pick one up there. Either way, it makes no difference to me. I can get it to you sometime today or tomorrow. Uh, you guys are performing the, the Tisser Labs starting on Thursday. You'll go to Monday and Tuesday is your test, correct? Uh, I guess. Okay. So somewhere in there you should be able to do this uh, basic radio picture, but we do have it all filled out for you in the slideshow. So let's... 
this part right here, the red part, is your transmit going out the antenna. The bottom part is your receive. So we just take a look at this at the basic level, nothing else. So we have an objective called transmit baseband to the distant end. So what is baseband? Baseband is the multiplex traffic that you're going to accomplish in three steps to get it out that antenna. The first step is modulating it onto a carrier. The second one is up converting it from an IF to an RF and amplification where you're going to amplify it enough to get it to the distant end. So let's take a look at these. So the first one is a modulator. Now with the modulator we're going to take that aggregate signal, the mission bit stream, the transmit aggregate is another word, um, baseband is what we're going to be using because of the jerk 239 tisser. We're going to convert that digital information and put it onto an IF signal. Now the IF signal is what I classify as what is it going to be in transmit, what is it going to be in receive. It's going to be different in the jerk 239. It's going to be in the 7.2 to 7.625 gigahertz. So look how far that aggregate's got to be modulated to. When you're talking receive, which we'll get in just a minute, it's about 70 megahertz. We'll look at that in just a minute. So we're going to modulate it. We're going to up convert it. We're going to take that IF to RF. So we're going to take that modulated signal, boost it up to the operating frequency. We're going to use something called a local oscillator, oscillator, and that's how we're going to get it up to the RF signal. And I'm going to show you coming tomorrow how that gets put onto the signal. When we get to the final stages, we need to amplify it because it's a pretty weak signal and we need to get it to the distant end. So we got to get a lot of power in order to do that using a high powered amplifier. So those are the three steps that we need in order to get baseband to the distant end. When we go to receive, we want to recover the baseband. Now baseband's where all the intelligence is and it's going to get routed through the multiplexer to the users or channels depending on how it's working. We are going to accomplish it in three steps. Normally the reverse of transmit. So if you got transmit down it's you can get received pretty easy. So we got RF signal recovery, in other words receive it we're going to amplify it using that RF signal recovery. Then we're going to down convert it, convert that RF to IF, and then once we get it down to that down conversion, we're going to clean it up and demodulate it into the baseband. So let's look at the steps here. The first one, we're going to bring it in, get it amplified, we're going to clean it up a little bit, and then send it to the down converter. We're going to take that RF converted into IF which is about 70 megahertz for the tisser. We're also going to use a local oscillator in order to mix the signal to break it down. Then we're going to get to a demodulator. We're going to convert it from IF to baseband. We also have something along that side known as AGC. AGC is always a receive function and the idea behind AGC is for a variant RF input gives us a constant, normally it's audio, but in this case it's going to be baseband output. So here is the drawn in picture of this. You have the multiplexer, in our case we could just relate it to the NSM, going into a modulator which could be our jerk 239. It has a modulator in there and then we're going to take it up convert it and then we're going to bring it into what's called an HPA a high powered amp and send it out the antenna then we're going to receive another signal and you're going to see this in the bigger picture of the jerk 239 
We're going to amplify it once we receive it. We're going to down convert it from RF to IF and then demodulate that IF into a baseband signal and then send it to our multiplexer and get it demulched into channels or users. We also have something called uh, a little bit more detailed picture but we're going to get to the branch assembly which I was leading up to. This kind of caught me off guard for a sec. But you can see from the demux shouldn't be demux, it should be mux to the modulator gets modulator, modulated, then it gets up converted. You'll notice that we have an oscillator here. We up convert it to the RF. So modulator is going to get us to the IF. IF is going to get us to the RF. RF gets amplified and then out the radio to the antenna. When we receive it, we're going to amplify it, clean it up a little bit, go to the down converter. It's using an oscillator right here. Once we down convert it from RF to IF, IF comes into the demodulator and we break it down into baseband. Next up is this branch assembly that I was talking about. This branch assembly is nothing but passive devices, passive electronic devices. We have something called an isolator. This is a duplexer. This is filters. A circulator, or I think that's called a diplexer, out to the antenna and then back into another filter. This whole section right here is all passive. And it's crazy how this circulator works, too. I had to research it, and all it is is this, it has ferrite iron cores in it and it has everything to do with the way the frequencies work. One's being sent out and the other one's being sent back in. It's a three-way you know input output and it directs paths. One goes to the receive side and then there's the other one coming from the transmit side. I don't know what the engineering background I've been trying to look for it but my goodness gracious it is for a simple circuit, it sure is complex in the theory. Next up, what does a branch assembly does? Well, you can read all of this. I just gave you a little bit about it. Uh, the suppression of unwanted harmonics. This is very true in transmit. It does generate external noise through the amplifiers, so we got to eliminate most of that noise. Anytime that we have a broad range of frequencies coming in the antenna we're going to need to do some filtering that's going to aid us in that selectivity of a small amount of frequencies so we can pick up our signal and of course when we are always transmitting we do have to monitor our output power because we don't want to overpower it or underpower it so let's take a look at each one of those items first one's called an oscillator Whichever way that arrow is pointing, that's where the signal is going to. You do not want the signal coming back in. Isolators are very good for transmit circuits. And what that does, it prevents that voltage standing wave ratio. In other words, if you were to take a slinky, stretch it out, do a little flick with it, and you would see the wave going down to the distant end, but once it hits that distant end, it's going to bounce back. That is basically a scenario of a return wave and it harms the original wave that's going out so that is one of the things that an isolator does it prevents that wave from getting back into the transmit gear because the last thing you want is one of those waves to come back in and toast your equipment it does provide some impedance matching and I like this, different mediums between the coax and waveguide. This is very true. When you're using any type of antenna, there is a problem between when you're going from that cable, connecting it up to that antenna. Why is that? Do you guys know what the ohmic impedance is for your radios? Take a wild guess. Impedance of the radios. Does anybody know? No? 
Hello? Is it like a number we're looking for? Or? Yep. What is the ohmic impedance? In other words, the value in ohms. Is it 200? 3000? What? We want to know what the impedance or the ohmic value. Ohms. Because impedance. Ohms. Are, yes. Very good. Who said that? I didn't. Airman Lord Garcia. Okay. Good job. How do you know that? I remember that number from block, um, I think two or three. Okay, good. I was going to say it's normally stated a lot in block two. Well, what's the ohmic value of your RF cable? In other words, the coax cable that goes between that and the antenna. Come on, guess if you have to. Seventy-five. It would be if it was for TV. So you're close. If my radio is 50 ohms, and we talk about impedance matching, what would our cable be? It'd have to be at least 100. 50 ohms. That matches, doesn't it? Well, what's the ohmic value of our antennas? 50 ohms. Here's where the problem lies. Most of your antennas are anywhere between 1 ohm and as high as 1700 ohms. So that's an impedance mismatch, isn't it? Well, with isolators, when you're matching that cable to an antenna, because there is an antenna inside the waveguide, there's got to be some type of impedance matching so it doesn't overload the back end or the transmit section. And that's what I'm trying to get at with this isolator. Because you have an impedance mismatch with the antenna, you're going to have some VSWR that's coming back. And the idea is if we can give some type of impedance matching when you make that connection, we'll do well. And this all goes back to block four theory too. So when we look at directional couplers, this one's a little bit different because what it is is it's nothing more than two RF diodes. And you're going, okay, I don't have a clue. Yeah, you do. Black and block one. Remember the watt meter that you had two little, uh, I'll think of it in a minute, had two little, actually those are RF diodes in them. Because you were looking at forward power and reflected power. Well, in a directional coupler, that's what's in it, is those RF diodes. And what it does is it measures forward power, but it also measures reflected power. The more forward power you have, the better off you are. The more uh, reflected power you have, the worse off that you are. And that's where that isolator would come into play at that point. So that's what a directional coupler does, is it measures outgoing power and incoming power if it's reflected. Next up is filters. Just like with anything else, when you get ready to send a signal out, you'll want to let only that frequency out. You don't want any others. So that's the whole idea behind a filter, is just to pass the one that you want to go out. You have something called a circulator, which is right there at the end. These circulators are a tri-connection. Both transmit and receive is going to be doing crazy things to where it prevents the receive getting into the transmit and transmit getting into the receive, and it goes in and out of the antenna. It gets pushed right out that antenna if you're transmit. And in receive, it just comes in on the receive line. It doesn't want to go to the transmit side. When you take a look at your receive signal, remember I told you that AGC for a variant RF input, you're going to get a constant output. In our case, it's going to be baseband. RSL means receive signal level. That is the incoming signal. When you guys are doing the tisser, you're going to be setting up relatively close. 
realistically, you should be between a mile to 10 miles with the small dish and all the way up to 25 miles for the large dish. Actually, it's less than 10 and less than 25, the way the tech order says. But the closer you get that dish be, uh, closer to each other, the stronger the signal is. So your AGC is going to have to react to that. In proportion, your gain is going to have to do something completely opposite. Your output is wanting to stay constant. So let me give you a scenario. You guys have probably heard this back in block two or three, but you have an aircraft. It's 200 miles out. It contacts the radio tower. If you didn't have AGC, that's a pretty weak signal, and you're going to have to turn that volume control completely up. As the plane gets closer and starts to contact you even more often, all of a sudden that volume is going to increase, so you're going to have to turn it down. So as you can imagine, as the plane gets closer, it's going to get louder. When the plane goes and takes off and goes out further, you're going to have to turn the volume up. All AGC is it's taking the human portion out. In other words, it's doing that constant either increase in the gain or decrease in the gain depending on the strength of the signal. So as you can see in these two boxes, if RSL, receive signal level, is increased, my AGC level is going to reflect that and also increase. My gain is going to decrease because it, getting, it, because it is getting too close. And the whole object behind these interactions is to keep that output constant. Now if we do the reverse of this, in other words, we spread the dishes apart or the plane apart from the, the tower, you're going to have a weaker signal. And AGC is going to reflect it. It's also going to be down. But my gain, i got to increase it to get that constant output. And you can see the two sentences down there where it says RSL and AGC are directly proportional. In other words, they reflect that incoming signal. And RSL and gain are inversely proportional. In other words, the closer I get, the less gain I need to get to get, keep that constant output. Next up we have terms, frequency accuracy, stability, bandwidth, frequency response, selectivity, gain, and sensitivity. Let's take a look at each one of them. You guys can read. What does the frequency accuracy and stability come in contact with that determines it? The oscillator. The better the oscillator, the better the frequency accuracy as well as stability. How does it work? You guys have heard this before, phase lock loop. That's how it keeps it on frequency. Bandwidth, difference between upper and lower frequencies and there are some other ad additives on this but we could just stay with bandwidth being the difference between uh, the upper and lower frequencies. Now it could either be upper and lower frequencies of what your band is taking up versus what the frequency range is of the radio. Next up, frequency response. Definition again, audio device or system that will produce or reproduce a signal. And it's got to be within a certain tolerances. Now for those of you that have opened up a brand new stereo system, to include car systems and so forth and so on, they actually have this in your manuals. You also have selectivity in here. This is the process to get the frequencies that you want and reject all the others. You have gain and sensitivity. Gain being the volume control on your radio or your amplifier of some sort. Sensitivity, how well I'm able to pull that signal out of a noise area and be able to distinguish what that intelligence is. Now you guys have probably done something called signal plus noise to noise ratio in block three. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, no, maybe? Wow. Class. Uh, 
You don't remember it? I'm not quite sure, sir. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so what is signal plus noise noise ratio? Okay. What you did is you took the noise, or excuse me, the signal that you were generating out of a signal generator. Normally it's around neg 97. I think the PRIC 113 did it at neg 102. I could be wrong, or neg 101. That's negative 101 dBm or dB. And it had a signal on it. You would take that signal, run it through your... I think it's a boonton, and you would take and eliminate the signal and see how far down the noise would drop. And if you had a 10 dB or greater drop, then you could hear the noise out of it in an acceptable fashion. And that told you that the radio was working fine. If not, you would have to take it in and get the... I think it's the receiver section removed and replaced. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I just I completely forgot about the lab. That was a part of the lab that we did. That is correct. See, I, I remember some of these things back in the day. I used to do the Prick 113 a lot for the pararescue guys, as well as the Track 176, which is a different version of the Prick 113. Next up, we have the systems approach. The best way I'm going to tell you about the system approach without having to read this to you is you will be out there and you will get a call that your equipment does not work. Well, when you check your equipment out, it's working just fine. The problem is it's somewhere else down the line that your equipment is taking. You know, in other words, it's trash in, trash out. Well, you got to figure out where the trash is coming from. So you literally got to troubleshoot sometimes someone else's stuff. And I have been on many occasions where I've had to troubleshoot someone else's phone lines because they were saying their phone lines are good. And we're going, no, our radio system is good. Your lines stink. And then have to bring them out in a tactfully nice way and explain to them how we're troubleshooting it and see if we are wrong even though we know they're right and once they figure it out it's their system then they you know they have an out but that happens all the time out there you may have to figure out if it's someone else's issue and let them attack it and be nice about it because you can what is it you can get more flies with honey than you can with vinegar so the idea is with the systems approach, you've got to troubleshoot the whole system, even if it might be someone else's equipment. Next up, we have performance measures, quality, reliability, and speed. Quality is how closely the output resembles the input. Reliability, how well it is, or how often is it available. They like to see percentages. 90% or better, they are extremely happy. Speed, how fast you can uh, process the data, or how quickly you can get your comm up. Everybody is well aware in block four you had to have a certain amount of time to get the antenna up. When you get to block 10, you're going to have X amount of time to get the mast or the antenna up or both in a set time and make comm within that time. So that is your speed. Next up, we have ancillary functions, switching auxiliary channel performance monitors and fault indicators. Switching, used for redundancy. What does that mean? Well, you got two pieces of equipment. One fails, the other one switches over to the working one. Normally, it gives you an indication that you've got a problem with the other piece of equipment. And normally your visual will help you out with that. Oh, geez, the light is not on. Or there's a red light on the equipment that tells me I have an error. The other one's working fine. Yay. We have an auxiliary channel. This minimizes the degradation of 
traffic bit stream. What does that mean? Well, it's one of those things where everybody is on the internet, but you have a different way of getting around it. Uh, let's just say that I don't have to get online even though I am online. To give you an example that I can think of right offhand is you got some of you are using your phones in order to look at Discord. Some of you are looking at your computers. Well, how about if I decide that I'm going to make a phone call and use the internet or whatever on my cell phone while I'm talking to you? Well, I'm not degrading from mission traffic. I'm actually speaking to you uh, while I'm doing the slideshow, but at the same time, I'm either texting or chatting or doing a messenger. That's, that's adjacent equipment, isn't it? Sure it is. That's an auxiliary channel. On the Tisser, you have baseband traffic, and then you have something called order wire. Well, order wire is the maintenance side where they can talk back and forth, or we can talk back and forth, to where we don't interrupt the mission traffic. That's the whole idea. Because if we had to get on, we would be taking away from some of the bandwidth on there. Next up, we have performance monitors and fault indicators. Performance monitors. On the Tisser, you'll have a meter. That meter will tell you, hey, if you switch to this you know, selection and that meter says it's in the green, hey, we're good to go. Now, that, that green part has an upper and lower limit to it. As long as it's in the green, it should be gold. When you have fault indicators, in other words, you put it in transmit, better known as operate, by the way, and you see that you have a red light somewhere, you might have a problem. Or better yet, if you're in the middle of testing it out and you have a test tone go off, you might have a problem. Those are fault indicators, both visual and audible. So we've gone over basic radio picture, fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessments, and auxiliary questions. Any auxiliary functions? Any questions? No, sir. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yes, sir. Probably boring as crap is right so i have a quick question sure. about the um it's about the uh, thing that uh i forgot the acronym for the um adjust the gain yeah um when what it sends it depending on how far you are it's agc okay um what is the limit on that is it just like as soon as you lose signal it just stops working or well that's very true it's kind of hard to get a signal in if you don't have any signal with so ADC, this. there's going to be a threshold, and it will cut out. Now, you guys have probably played with the squelch button on the Prick 113, or the, the knob. Yes, no, maybe? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, what is a squelch? Well, it's a threshold. You set that threshold, right? And when a signal gets strong enough, it's going to, quote-unquote, break squelch in other words you're going to hear that audible so that is a setting that you can uh, rely on that AGC once it gets it strong enough you're going to have a constant output but it's got to break that threshold for you to hear it if that's what you're asking on AGC okay like, yes, sir. yes no maybe I got it now okay all right, so we're going to look at uh, three Bravo, identify basic facts and principles, capabilities, and limitations of modems. You guys know that you got to pass with a 70%. That's, you can't get any more than uh, 12 in Any more than 12 incorrect, you're, you're past the 70 mark. There is 40 questions on there. I suggest very highly that you pay attention to each one of those questions because this is probably the closest I've ever seen any one of our tests get to a college level test because you guys are taking college, by the way. 
So if you got any questions, we're going to be doing a review on Thursday. Well, not a review. We're going to be doing appraisals on Thursday, so make sure that you get them done. They're in the Block 7 resource folder at the top part of this page. So make sure that you get them and start working on them. All right, so the first thing we look at the AFSC application. What are you going to do? You're going to work with modems. You guys are dealing with modems day in and day out just because you're on the computer. We talk about general modem principles, types of modulation, forward error correction, interleaving, traditional modems, and IP based modems. This is going to be pretty quick. You need to stop me if you get a little confused on this. I'll try to keep it straight for you. So what the heck is a modem? The easiest way to explain this. Has anybody ever seen the History Channel's, uh, I guess you want to say a conflict between, I think it was Edison and Tesla? In other words, AC versus DC? I believe so, yes, sir. Okay. So which one yes, goes... Yes, sir. Okay. Well, which one goes farther, AC or DC? AC. AC. Okay. So how do we get DC, better known as a digital information, how do we get it from point A to point B? You tell me, sir. Oh. It travels by AC and then converted to DC at the... Okay. At the so we're going to modulate it, i.e. the modems, into an AC signal and send it to the distant end and then it's going to get demodulated back into a digital signal and that's, the, that's how modems work. You get modulation and demodulation happening all the time. So this is what's happening. Modems is taking a digital signal and using it either, and there's several different methods here, uh, we're going to go through three of them. And how we're going to get from a, you know, DC to AC, send it over a long distance, get it from AC back to DC. So let's take a look at these. BOD. Everybody has seen BOD before. We've known it as BOD rate. Now we're going to change gears and call it the symbol. Why? Because computer people like it as a symbol. I don't know why. So we're going to look at a couple different modulation techniques. We're going to see, now don't get confused with bit versus baud, all right? Bit versus byte is another one. Bits, you have eight bits in, in one word, that could be one byte. So depends on how things are worded, try to keep them straight. What do we need to know? That symbols are the same thing as baud. So you can have those interchanged here. We can do as much as 10 bits per symbol. So we're going to take a look at these. The first three that we're going to look at as far as going from a digital signal to an analog signal is frequency, amplitude, and phase. Phase is where things got are, are starting to get a little complicated. So let's take a look at these. First one is frequency. If you've ever remembered back in the old, uh, I shouldn't say old days, we still have them on certain ham radio uh, areas where you can do what's called diddy bop. What is diddy bop? D I T T Y B O P. Well, if anybody's ever watched the movie Titanic, when they go in, they start messaging using a uh, tapper, so to speak. That's diddy bop. That's basically doing dots and dashes over the RF way. And that's how things started for digital communications. Frequency shift keying is one bit per symbol. Let's take a look at them. As you can see, for any time we have a one, we will have a higher frequency. Anytime you see a zero, we will have a lower frequency. And as you can see, starting from right to left, and how the digital signal is flowing. We have something called amplitude shift keying. So FSK versus ASK. One is dealing with frequency. This one is dealing with amplitude. Ones and zeros. 
logic of one is one amplitude, zero is a different amplitude. It's also one bit per symbol. Let's take a look at them. So lower amplitude could be a zero, higher amplitude is a one. Those are pretty simple. Now we're getting into phase. We have two that we're going to go through real quick, and one is called binary, and the other one's called quadrature. So it's binary phase shift king and quadrature phase shift king. Binary is going to shift our waveform depending if it is ones or zeros. We're going to shift it when it goes from a logic of one to a zero and zero to a one is one bit per symbol. So let's take a look at these. FSK, ASK, and binary phase shifting all have one bit per symbol. Let's take a look at binary. You can see we have a one. When it goes to a different logic, in this case a zero, we're going to swap the waveform out. When we get back to another difference in logic, in this case we're going from a zero to one, we're going to shift the waveform. Then you can see that we get back to a couple zeros in a, war, in a row. It doesn't shift at all when it's changing, the, uh, when we go from the data from zero to zero. It's when we go from a zero to one or a one to zero. Again, that is one bit per symbol. Quadrature, though, starts to become a little complicated. This is two bits per symbol. When we get to QAM, and I can't remember the acronym for QAM, it's, it's elude me at this point. Uh, that one you can actually see in some of the TVs that we have using QAM. HF is starting, or ham radios are starting to use QAM as a way to send packet data, and they are doing quite well with it. And I think that's the reason why they're going to start re-emphasizing HF along with, oh crap, China can shoot our missile, our satellite gear out of the <laughs> atmosphere. So I think that's the other reason why we're going headstrong into HF here pretty soon. So always remember quadrature phase shift king, two bits per symbol. With QAM, you can go as high as 10 bits per symbol currently. And QAM is played with our 4K, soon to be 10K TVs. So you can see that uh, a lot of information is happening on QAM. We have something called forward air correction. The whole idea behind forward air correction is so I don't have to keep resending all the time. The idea is if I keep resending stuff over a period of time because of the noise on the lines, I got to start uh, keeping copies of every one of them. And then finally, I might get a complete copy out of the many items that I have resent. The idea behind for correction is sending corrective errors so I can get a one complete copy the first time and sometimes the second time. The idea behind this is so I don't have to buy expensive equipment on the distant end because that's what it ended up to be is you would have lots and lots of hard drives on everybody's end just to keep the amount of storage necessary to figure out what you're sending. So forward air correction, the way we do it is we send it from the transmit end and we send all that extra stuff to the distant end by the way these rates are described here. You got a half, three quarters, two thirds, five six, and seven eighths. <clears throat> but they don't classify that as. So if you take a look at the last number, that's how many digits are being sent. But the first digit is the original bit of intelligence. The second one is the corrective bit. <clears throat> three quarters. You will have four bits being sent. Three of those bits will be the intelligence, but the fourth one will be a corrective. Now, why is it that they're always sending these forward error correction? Well, the bottom line is, is when we have noisy lines, because not everybody has fiber, 
when we have noisy lines or somebody accidentally cut the lines and just making a small connection where it's a hit and miss by sending these forward air corrections the distant end is going to be able to see it and hopefully put it all back together again this is what I classify as the wheel of fortune on the distant end so you'll be given some of the letters and the idea is to put all those letters in a correct spot so you can solve the puzzle. Get it? Wheel of Fortune? Forward air correction? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, that's the simplest way I could think of. So next up we have something called How in the World Do We Figure Out Symbol Rate, better known as BOD Rate. Well, we combine data rate, modulation type, and forward air correction. So if we have this little box here showing everything being put together to give us our symbol rate. Now there is a mathematical equation. I'm not going to have you go through it. It should be in your study guide workbook. But it just gives you an idea how everything is put together to give us our symbol rate. Now please understand too we also have overhead in there and that data rate and so forth and so on. There's more to it. But combined data rate for their correction modulation everything should work out to give us our symbol rate slash baud rate those are the three items interleaving is just another way of saying hey I got forward air correction it's going to be a little bit different we send it in a block versus uh, you know a stream I guess they call them packets and by interleaving the error correction in there, they're able to do a lot better job than Wheel of Fortune could ever do. So in other words, most of it will show up at the this and then instead of a whole bunch of letters being missing. So now we're going to change gears and take a look at traditional modem types. We have telephone mod uh, modem called POTS, and they're still out there, believe it or not. I don't know if anybody's ever had 56K for their dial-up. I guess everybody's used to DSL or cable or some form of digital communication not having to call a number. No? Anybody have to grow up with that? Dial-up, yes. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating, especially when you're talking on the phone and you hear a blip on the this and then. Or you try to call someone and uh, you hear in the background somebody's kid going, Somebody's kicked me off! <laughs> it's always fun that way. Then you have something called a satellite modem. You guys have dealt with the NSM. So there you go. Then we have something called fiber optic modem. These are the stages that the fiber optic modem is referencing. You have the first stage. In other words, we're going to send some data to the this and then. That's one way to look at it. We're in transmit. So you have the modulator to modulate our digital signal. Then we're going to transmit it out. On the this and then, it's going to receive it. It's going to filter it. And then it's going to demodulate. So that's how fiber optic modems work. IP modems, you guys are dealing with Wi-Fi if you're in the dorm. If you're on What's it called? Uh, Boingo, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Or I should say a lot of times it's bad. So that's what you're dealing with. Next up, you guys probably didn't even know it unless the instructor pointed it out to you. Did anyone point out the iDirect modem to you? No, sir. Okay. When you walked into room 116 for the NSM lab, far left, there looked like a old analog TV box, but if you ever got close to it, you would notice that there's a whole bunch of uh, horizontal cards in it. Pretty large cards. That's an iDirect modem. On that iDirect modem, you can see some of the capabilities in TDMA versus S. FDMA, 
But the biggest part about the IR direct modems is it can transmit out C band, X band, KU band, and KA band. What does that mean? It means about 2.3 all the way up to about 40 gig. So you're tripping between the SHF and the EHF frequency range. C band, X band, the KUKA band as one person has told me to present it to see if you guys can remember it. Now how did the KU and the KA band come into play? Isn't there a K band? Not to be confused with K-pop. Yes, there is a K band out there. KU means it's under the K band. KA band is above the K band. That's how they came into being. And there's charts out there to show you the frequency ranges out there. Just Google it. So we've gone over general modem principles, types of modulation, forward air correction, interleaving, traditional modems, and IP based modems. Is there any questions? No, sir. No questions. We'll continue on. We're going to identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, and limitations of line of sight radios. You guys have probably come to figure out that we deal a lot with antennas and the equipment. That's very true. So with anything that we are dealing with, you've got to have some part of an understanding on how things work. Without it, without this knowledge, you're going to be what I call overwhelmed with information as a technician. So we're going to look at line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of repeaters. Gentlemen, this is in your C's and D's. Let me pull up. See which one it is. Well, oh, rats, it's not going to give it to me. I got to disengage from this. It is in your block 7 information should be 3D133-7.5 circuits and diagrams tropo so you see this particular diagram well when I scale it out but I just wanted to let you know you guys have the electronic copy we're gonna go through this part this this part right here is pretty important to review you're gonna see a couple different repeaters and this is the tisser that we're gonna be going over starting tomorrow so I just want to make mention this particular segment of the slideshow is about this part and this part So let's get back to our line of sight. From block four, this is taken completely right out of the text there. As long as you don't have physical optic, uh, physical objects in between your transmitter and receiving antenna, you should be golden. Now there are some factors in here, but with this particular line of sight, is if you get anything in between it, you're not going to communicate as opposed to if you had a omnidirectional antenna or a bidirectional antenna and you get something in the way, you have this diffraction, multipathing, and everything else that could come into play in order to get to the distant end. These are highly directional, so that's what they mean about physical objects. So if you can't hit the antenna on the distant end, you got something in the way. Or it's too far out. So this is that picture I was showing you about. The radio horizon extends 15% farther than optical. In other words, how far out can I see it? Well, because of the electrical portion of the Earth, you know that we're going to have some type of ground wave hugging the Earth. 
It's not going to go too far, but it is going to go farther than our optical horizon. Now, with true horizon, that's where I can pretty much where the Earth curvature is, that's what it's explaining. So you have true horizon, curvature of the Earth, versus optical horizon, how far I can see out there, versus the radio horizon, which is even farther than the true horizon in optical. This is a typical line of sight. We got 20 to 50 mile range, and that has everything to do with the frequencies. In our case, they deal with 3 to 50 gig. Power is 1 to 5 watts. Whoops, too far. Our practical applications for line of sight radios, in our case, most of our equipment, we're going to transmit anywhere between a couple miles to maybe 100 miles. Now, the idea behind line of sight radios is we need to get from point A to point B. Now, on the base with tissers, that makes the most sense because how many of you want to dig a ditch to put your cable in so people don't you know, run over it and stuff like that? Well, I don't want to be digging ditches. That, that's pretty you know, tough, especially if you don't have a backhoe to do it or some type of cable barrier or thingamabobber that they've got nowadays or they can just take the cable and or the the pipe and just shove it under the ground as they're they're going with it and then thread the cable through it all in one whack so with line of sight radios we're able to take our communications and shoot it across the base without having to dig cable now of course it also has some limitations such as terrain and distance. For example, I don't want to dig cable for the next 20 miles. Isn't practical. Well, maybe I want to shoot that over top of the uh, mountaintop there and get it an extra 20 miles. Well, this is where repeaters come into play because that's going to extend our radio horizon. There are a bunch of different things we got to look at when it comes to repeaters. What are they? Well, they're a transmitter and, repeat and receiver. Well, they got to do two functions. First of all is frequency translation. What does that mean? I like to call it frequency conversion. What you're going to do is you're going to receive one frequency and convert it into a brand new frequency within the equipment's frequency range, of course. And the idea behind that is so you don't interfere with the, new fre with the frequency that you just received. The next part of that story, because of it being weak when it hits the repeater, you're going to have to amplify it. So those are the two main things we got to worry about when we're dealing with transmitters. It's how we're able to convert it and how well we are able to uh, amplify it. All right. Next up, we have four different types of repeaters. We got an RF, the IF, baseband, and audio. First one up is the RF one. What's it do? Well, you have the two items that we just discussed, which is frequency conversion. So the first part is we got 440 is being received, and we change it to 4660 megahertz on the other end. So there's our com frequency conversion. We're going to take a weak signal, amplify it, then re-amplify it to get it to the distant end. Again, these are all line of sight. They're not omnidirectional, by the way. You'll notice how we converted the frequency. We use something called a local oscillator. So we've satisfied the two items that we just discussed, which is frequency translation and amplification in order to do what a repeater needs to do. Next up, we have an IF repeater. 
you'll notice that there's some differences between the RF repeater versus the IF repeater. What does it do? Well, it still has frequency conversion going from 440 4, 400 megahertz to 4660 megahertz from one end to the other. But this one breaks it down into an IF function. So we take the signal, instead of converting it into a different signal, we're going to break it down into 70 megahertz. Now, one of the things that is nice about breaking it down into the IF is we start cleaning it up as far as noise is concerned. So, you know, here's the amplification part. So we take our weak signal, amplify it. We convert it into a different frequency. In this case, we broke it down, down converted it. We amplified it because anytime we manipulate the signal like this, we always amplify. We take an up conversion, notice the two oscillators in here, by the way, to what the RF output will be and then we amplify it. So we satisfied the frequency translation and amplification but we broke the signal down even farther. Next up we have a baseband repeater. This one is going to break it down into even not the the IF but it's going to break it down into the digital signal. The nice thing about that is this bottom sentence we can use it to insert or pull out different parts of the equipment and keep sending the signal on. So realistically you could actually have in this case a small scenario let's just say in Afghanistan you have the base down in the valley and up at the top of the hill you have a repeater site. Well at that repeater site you may have an outpost and that outpost still needs information and, and they're, they're uh, you know, the computers, the phones, and stuff like that. So they'll be pulling that signal off between that place and wherever else they needed to communicate down in the other valley. So you may have, you know, the actual base, outpost, and then another base over here on the distant side. Two reasons that I can see having an outpost right here where you can pull that traffic off of. One, to protect the repeater site. Two, to make sure that the observation, because that would be an observation post, in seeing what the enemy may be doing. Next up we have an audio repeater. The biggest thing about that is it breaks it down into the most simplest forms of intelligence. Could be audio, could be your computer, whatever you need to do, but that is the whole bottom line is, is we had basically taken the signal from one base and pulling it off and putting it into the most simplest form where communication happens. One drawback to this. Freaking expensive. So here are the limitations of the repeaters. You have distance, equipment, and terrain and the needs of the communication network. Every one of these top three is all about what do you need to do. This last one, needs of the communication network. That one has everything to do with how much money you've been able to get. If you put in a request that you need to have all of this because of that, you're probably going to get the money to get because there's a need for this communication network. <clears throat> but if the repeaters aren't going to be able to get past this distance, equipment, capability, and terrain, then you're probably not going to get money to satisfy this last one. So the bottom line is the limitation of the repeaters is distance, how far I need to go, equipment capability, you know, what is my equipment going to do, what terrain it needs to cover, and do I really need it? That's the big thing. Because if you're on state side, more than likely, yeah, these three are playing a problem. You need to get communication out there, but it's not meeting the needs of the network. It was a desired outcome. Next up, we have a noise factor, FDM, well, I call it FDMA, frequency versus time. Frequency, you're going to have eight consecutive links. You could say that's your RF repeater. 
your time, you're looking at your baseband, if not an audio. Again, these as you get uh, more distance between them, it will determine the needs of the network. For example, if I need to get 120 miles, but my equipment uh, will have too much noise on it, then obviously that's a limitation to repeater because my uh, noise factor is going to be a problem. And there, there we have it. Line of sight repeaters uh, and limitations of repeaters. Any questions? Anybody snoozing on me yet? No, no sir. <laughs> Smile, it's the heck just happened. One more and then I'll turn you loose. What time is it? 1041, sir. Okay. You would think I'd know that on the bottom right hand side of both my monitors. Wow. And, and thank you. No problem, sir. Did everybody have a bad weekend? Because normally I got one or two of you constantly talking and asking questions. What's up? Just kind of a boring weekend. It's just a slow. Uh, I can't go off base or really hardly do anything, so it's... It's great that we got four days. It's there's really nothing to do. Yep. You guys didn't play games or anything like that, or video games are boring. Yeah. Can't hardly play video games with Boingo. <laughs> More likely, uh, what console games would be a better way of saying it, right? Pretty much anything that's not online. Yeah. Well, I did have it. Go ahead. Oh, uh, it's it's not important. Oh. I did my first video stream this weekend on Twitch. Oh joy. Can't I, I'm still trying to the, the jury's out on it. Alright, so we have identify basic facts about Tropo. Uh, hopefully this will be quick and painless for you guys. Hey, it's almost lunchtime, right? Go to that yes, joyful defect. All right. Uh, Tropo is one of those things we've dealt with it in Block 4. We just mentioned it. I classified it as over the horizon because when you take a look at it, it is very limited when you look at beyond line of sight. Beyond line of sight, yeah, it's over the horizon, but beyond line of sight can get you 300 to several thousands of miles. In fact, some instances, and this has happened twice since I've been dealing with HF, where you would speak and you would hear yourself. That's, that's completely around the world. And that is happens on a very unusual occasion more of a rarity than anything else so when we talk tropospheric communication antenna terms and tropo uh, antennas we're dealing with the troposphere when they say beyond line of sight communications yeah I classify it as over the horizon because now you're dealing with the tropo and the problem with the tropo is you really got to saturate it in order for it to refract back down to earth it is the lowest portion of the atmosphere this is the air we breathe higher up you get the thinner it gets most of these signals and this is the reason why will go right out that atmosphere and keep on trucking it only uses a very very small portion of the transmitted signal to refract back down to earth should be refract not reflect back down to earth so there you have it gentlemen you take a look at the tropo now there's the
portion that goes in between the tropo to the stratosphere can't remember the name of it but that's mainly the portion of where it gets refracted back down to earth everything else keeps going right out through the atmosphere the output oh my goodness this is a part of the problem that you have with tropo you got to have 300 to 50,000 watts anywhere from 350 megahertz to 8 gigahertz you'll notice that it says 595 miles fixed if you look on any credible website you'll see anywhere between 8 580 all the way up to 610 they just chose that number because it was the first thing they came across and then if you're in the tactical sense it's 150 miles the biggest problem with tropos if you're in a wartime situation you do not want to be anywhere near the front lines with it why because of the output power that it's generating and the enemy can see it even though it's a highly directional antenna scatter volume better known as common volume what does it mean it means it's that little place right here that gets refracted back down to earth and I'll show you here in just a minute well is it not going there it is there's the common volume right there or scatter scatter volume and you can see where we call scatter angle no big deal the biggest thing about tropo is you're going to have these what they call diversity systems you got polarization angle space and frequency polarization now you guys have probably already heard in block four that it, a linear antenna you cannot mix the polarity on them in order to communicate you can't communicate between a horizontal antenna and a vertical antenna and vice versa the problem with that is your E and H fields well actually your E fields are opposite of each other so it's a big problem with polarization diversity we have this little thing where we transmit one polarity but we receive it a little differently now you guys know what the Nivis is, correct? Near Vertical Incident Skywave. Yes, sir. Okay. Those wires that was holding up the mast, that's part of your antenna, were at an angle. Well, at an angle, you can receive both horizontally and vertically polarized signals. In the tisser, if you take a look at that, you will notice that this antenna and it basically is less than I would probably say a quarter inch that you might be able to see when you put the waveguide on but it's at an angle it's at a 45 degree angle so it won't matter what polarity that you send out but it's going to receive it that's at polarization because you can't have two horizontally polarized signals being transmitted because it will interfere with each other so one's going to be and I point this to you because when you see it in lab you're going to realize oh yeah he was right you're going to see that one end is always transmitting at a horizontal polarization the other end will be transmitting at a vertical polarization that's that polarization diversity is to keep your transmit from interrupting your other transmit angle that has everything to do with your scatter volume your space how far away you are from the antenna and frequency you're going to hear this a lot too and you've already seen it that we always like to keep our transmit frequencies about 200 megahertz away from our receive frequency that's at frequency diversity because you can't transmit and receive all in the same frequency it'll interfere we have antenna turns better known as reciprocity you guys have seen this back in block four it means that your antenna can transmit as well as it can receive directivity and gain higher the directivity higher the gain lower directivity lower gain just think of it this way an omnidirectional antenna 
is not going to go very far unless you had a unidirectional antenna. And that's what these antennas you're getting ready to deal with, better known as dish or parabolic dishes or whatever you want to call them. Horn antennas are another where they are extremely high in directivity, which are going to have higher in gain. Frequency? If someone showed you the equation for your electrical length, you'll notice that the higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna. So if you're at 3 megahertz, that's a 100 meter length in your electrical length. If you've got 30 megahertz, you will be 10 meters. That's a significant difference. So the higher up you go in frequency, the smaller the antenna is going to get. The lower in the frequency, the larger the antenna. To the antennas I just spoke about, which are the horn and parabolic, these are extremely high in gain and directivity. Horn, again, you've gone over this in block four. Parabolic, this is something a little relatively new to you. This is just like Dish Network or DirecTV. We have two different types of feeds. We got a front feed and rear feed. Now you'll notice this little sentence in the, in the middle here. It says size and gain are directly proportional. Well, that's very true. The larger your parabolic dish, the better the gain that you're going to have, as well as your uh, waveguide. Depends on your waveguide too. So it depends on how everything is placed. And yes, you could have a large dish but that doesn't mean you have a lower frequency. This means that you're trying to get more gain. The front feed, you've seen most of these on your direct TV. If you take a look at the satellite antennas when you pass Jones Hall in that little gated in area, I think most of those are center fed. I think there's one that has an offset. The Tisser antenna is what you're going to start seeing. We have a rear feed. One is called a Cassegrainian, the other one's a Cutler. The one that we are dealing with with the Tisser is a Cutler antenna. Here's a front feed, just gives you a picture of it. Offset. Cassegrainian. The difference between a Cassegrainian is this little parabolic subreflector. Feed horns on the rear of the dish. The cutler on this particular end, there will be a couple of metal flat reflectors. Now, with the tisser, the short antenna has the ping pong ball cover ripped off of it, and you should be able to see it. When you look underneath those two metal reflectors, you will see two rectangle holes. That is where the beams will either enter or exit out of to be either sent or received. The idea is if we have, let me see if I can go back to it, if we have a transmitted path, we're going to shoot it out of the feed horn, it's going to hit those metal reflectors, bounce off the dish, and then out. If we're receiving, it's the opposite way. And there you have it. Tropocom, antenna terms, tropospheric antennas. Questions? Yes. Uh, uh, you broke off there, Bisco. Oh, I'm good, sir. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Yes? Maybe? All right, gentlemen. We are going to go and hit objective, what was that one, for Charlie this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Does everybody understand that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful lunch, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock. All right. Thank you, sir.
All right. Thanks, sir. Take care, guys.